Uh, today I'm going to talk about foreign affairs translation just because it's Washington, basically. <laughs> and that's not a very good reason, perhaps, uh, given your very diverse interests. So what I'm going to do is pick a very small text, analyze it according to its ambiguities, and then suggest three ways it can be um, interpreted. Um, one will be linguistic, uh, the second will be political literary, and the third will be the kind of translation studies that I'm trying to work on. So the, the subtext here is really how does translation and translation studies in the um, European Canadian tradition, which is where I would put myself, how does that fit in with linguistic and literary studies? Okay, that's the problem I think that uh, is on the agenda in the United States, where you've had the training programs at Georgetown, at Monterey, uh, at Kent State, and more recently, uh, Baltimore, American University, Maryland, uh, doing linguistic training, and then comparative literature has picked up on the translation studies thing, uh, giving it a, a rather heavier theorization than it had in the linguistic tradition. So I'm coming at that from the outside, looking at what's happening in the States, and say, hey, what, where do we fit in? That's, that's what I'm doing. Okay. So with that, I'm going to move to my text. It's not, not that bad then, uh, but it was brought to our attention on the international stage when uh, then President-elect Trump, in January of last year, 2017, said suddenly that the one China policy was on the table. Everything is open to negotiation. And as you might be aware, there is no more important foreign affairs relationship than China, the United States. And that's what I'm looking at here, okay? Now, uh, Trump's statement was very quickly rectified by uh, various levels of officials saying, no, 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 it's the same policy you've always had, it always had. Nothing has changed, as if nothing had changed. Uh, but Trump was right. And that's the scary thing about it, I think. Uh, what hadn't changed was a non-resolution. What I'm going to investigate here is how the one policy one China policy was put into place without resolution in such a way that technically it is still open to negotiation. Here's my text. Very simple text. It's going to take me some time to get there. Uh, it's the 1972 joint communique. It's the first of three communiques which dealt with this problem. It's the result of uh, secret talks between Richard Nixon and Xiao Enlai, then Premier of China, uh, with Henry Kissinger being the mastermind in the background. So there's some pretty heavy foreign affairs expertise at work here. The text says, the United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China, and that Taiwan is a part of China. Simple enough, that's a one China policy, you would say. Right? But there's a problem in this verb, acknowledges. Uh, to acknowledge can be a performative or a constative. A performative means, I think I've got it here, we hereby acknowledge. Okay, and the, the saying is the doing, the saying is an action. It's not like I sing badly, uh, it's I acknowledge you, and, or uh, I hereby pronounce you, or I promise, and all these other performances. Uh, acknowledge could be working here as a performative, which is what you would expect in a policy change. Now, is it a performative? That's up to some doubt, because it could be read either way, but the thing you're acknowledging, note, is not what China is, what we're acknowledging, the United States is acknowledging, is that Chinese maintain something. 
So what it's doing is saying, you know, I acknowledge this thing exists, that's okay. Or I acknowledge that people think this about that. But I'm not talking about the thing itself. Okay? Uh, as one of the commentators uh, puts it, we hear you. Okay, we know what's going on, that's all right, but, but they are not saying anything about who or what is China or the legitimate government of China. Now, uh, with a doctoral student uh, of mine, Hu Bei, uh, we've been analyzing the Chinese texts of these various communiques. And in this first communique, the Chinese text um, uses Ren uh, Qidao, which other Chinese scholars <coughs> Just as well, okay. <laughs> so my, my pronunciation was perfect, you know, with the intonation. Uh, which has uh, the extension of understands, going on to recognize, but not full acknowledgement and not a full performative. It could be read that way in Chinese if somebody unkindly edited out the middle phrase. Uh, it could be read, the United States recognizes bah, 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 there is but one China and Taiwan. Okay, if Chinese press or politicians wanted to cite it that way. But the text itself more or less agrees with the slipperiness of the English language text. No great problem. Uh, Kissinger's awareness at that time uh, in the meetings that they had when Nixon was in China, was that the Chinese wanted to negotiate many, many things, especially trade. And this was a sticking point. So the purpose of the whole policy was to remove it from contention so they could agree on things they wanted to agree about. So this statement, this communique, was really saying, let's not talk about China now. We, we hear you, we know what's going on, but that's off the table and we're going to proceed with all these other things. Okay, it was uh, uh, the unlinking of the negotiation and it was very successful. Uh, it's so successful that that text still remains, in essence, the United States policy today. As you can see, Donald Trump was quite right. It's still open to negotiation. Uh, there have been changes over the years, and I'll fast forward, this is actually the third communique now, in 1979, when we got the same thing, acknowledges, slightly different formulation you'll see, but it still acknowledges the Chinese position, and here the translation has shifted in Chinese to Chengden. Chengden means recognizes, and potentially agrees with. And if the Chinese want to read it as agrees with, then the United States has agreed with the one China policy. Okay, so the shift is not in the English, the shift is in the way it's translated into Chinese, and the terms don't correspond exactly, but that's how translation works. This is what Kissinger called constructive ambiguity. We're going to write a text that can be read in two ways, and everybody can read what they want into it, and as long as it's not important, as long as we can get that sort of understanding off the table, it achieves its purpose. Now, constructive ambiguity of the kind I'm talking about here operates not in the English text or in the Chinese text, but in the fact that both these versions are equally legitimate. So the English can read what they want, and the Chinese can read what they want, and we'll proceed with other things. History sort of stands still on that. Now, constructive ambiguity is used quite a lot in diplomatic language, monolingually and translationally, or bilingually. And here are some very famous examples of bilingual constructive ambiguity. Uh, UN Resolution 242, which says uh, that Israel has to withdraw from territory occupied in the uh, 67 conflict. And uh, as is well known, the French uh, refers to des uh, territoires occupés. Des is uh, very clearly the les. It's uh, all the territories that are occupied. 
uh, both versions are officially legitimate and valid, uh, so the Israelis consistently read the English version, which means they retreated from a few outposts and still remain occupying the territories today, whereas other countries in the UN could vote in favor of this because they were looking at the French version. What happened is put on hold and we still haven't solved Israel-Palestine, the same as we haven't really solved Taiwan. These constructive ambiguities serve their purpose unless you have them to live in Palestine. Uh, another example of this, very equally famous, uh, is uh, an incident that occurred in 2001 when an American aircraft strayed into Chinese uh, airspace and in the conflict that followed, a Chinese airman was killed. Uh, President Bush at the time and uh, Secretary of State Powell Seem to apologize. You'll see this text here. Can you read the text? Yeah. There's one way away. Uh, you can see they're very sorry. They've got sincere regret and they're very, very sorry twice. They've got to be really sorry. Okay. But did they say, we're sorry for what we did? No. They're sorry that the plane went in there. We're sorry the airman was killed. Um, but are we sorry as you say, I'm sorry for what I did? No, it's not a performative in that sense of saying you're sorry, okay? However, the Chinese translation in this case is, it could be read as an apology or regret, regret is what we have in the English, but also extends to apology for a wrongful action. So the United States saved face, face we're sorry, but we didn't do anything wrong. And China say, face, the Americans have apologized for the purpose of internal consumption in China. Again, a case of constructive attitude. Uh, now, the text I'm dealing with has two problems. That's the first problem. Okay, constructive ambiguity with performatives. Here's my linguistic analysis of that problem. Well, the kind of translation studies I do has been accused, notably by Emily Apton from this country, of being concerned with accuracy and nothing but accuracy, of not realizing that translations are transformations and, uh, uh, and are political acts. And I want to insist that there is no question here of the translation being accurate or inaccurate with respect to some prior translational reality. What's happened here is that the English term, in this case acknowledged, has remained constant, and the Chinese terms have shifted with time to the extent that the Chen Ren has become the established equivalent. My point here is that equivalence in this kind of work where you're establishing a new relationship are not pre-given. They are created through the translational work over history, over time. Equivalence is produced by translations. It's not translations reproducing equivalents that lie in a sensualist nature. Okay? Uh, you can take this back to Jacobson's uh, view that uh, the meaning of a linguistic sign is its translation into some further alternative sign where meaning is translation. Translation is what produces the meaning. The meaning wasn't there beforehand, it's what comes out of translation. And I think you can see that in the example I'm analyzing. It's not as if there was some truth to which we are being inaccurate. It's a question of something new being produced uh, under the aegis of equivalence. More interesting, however, is the performative kind of analysis. Now, there is a maxim in translation that a performative starts text is not performative when it's translated. Okay, for this you really have to know what performatives are. Okay, I declare the meeting open. I say this and the meeting's open because the saying is the action. But if a simultaneous interpreter who is never simultaneous, they always come a little bit later, 
says uh, Judy to have Umberto Valerio, obviously that is constatic because the person has already declared it over. A translation cannot be performative, even though it's translating a performative. Interesting. Uh, at one stage I was worried, is, is this true? Is this part of the grammar of translation? Does it apply to all cases? And in fact, when you pursue this, you start to see it doesn't apply. There are cases where a translation assumes strong performatives in the Austin sense, linguistic sense, or clear performativity in the wider sense uh, that we've acquired through the work of uh, notably uh, Judith Butler. This is an example that I take from a Shakespeare translated by Michel Bernot uh, in Quebec into Quebec uh, uh, French, colloquial uh, French. And uh, what's interesting there, the an analysis is by Annie Dresse, it's not my analysis, is that the translator has um, taken the, the pseudo performative to remember, ah, I remember, I remember this, I remember all I have lost. And the act of remembering when you vocalize it is the performative in the Quebecois French that comes out as avant souvenir. And uh, Christy makes the point that this uh, resonates in Quebecois society because at the time, everyone's number plate had je, je me souviens, I remember. And this, having Macbeth say this, is like Macbeth saying, hey, I'm driving around with my number plate and I remember too. And what is being remembered is not necessarily the fate of Scotland, although it might be, but you see at the end they've add, added la parte faible, the part of the weak, which is not in Shakespeare's text. Uh, what the translation is doing is mapping uh, Quebec, uh, Quebec on Scotland, Scotland on to Quebec, uh, resistance uh, to the dominant power. Uh, other examples occur in Catalan, especially one, one my, my former colleague, uh, Joaquim Malacayafre, uh, translated Joyce's Ulysses into Catalan, and Ulysses starts at the, in, at the castle in Dublin, which is the, the symbol of British colonial domination, and that's rendered into Catalan as La Ciudadela, which is a, a part of Barcelona, which was the fort of Castilian, or Spanish central domination in, in Catalonia, very clearly mapping the situation of Ireland onto the situation of, um, of Catalonia in the same way as being done here. Uh, you can see that in this case, uh, translations assume a performativity that is not in the, uh, the subtext that they were. So the, the maxim which is there for standard translation practice can be broken by some forms of translation. But we go back into the history and we find that the most famous translators were doing precisely this. Uh, when Luther added a line uh, that uh, the righteousness is achieved only through faith, uh, where the Greek text and the Latin of, of Jerome uh, did not have the word only, uh, that little word put in there uh, set off a good part of the Reformation. It was an, an implicit argument against the indulgences of the Catholic Church was uh, living on at the time, only faith. Uh, Etienne Dolay, uh, similar period, uh, similar case of heresy, made the mistake of, of adding uh, uh, to a pseudo-Plato text. Plato's text just says that don't worry about dying because you, you won't be here, so it's not going to hurt you. Uh, whereas uh, Dole wanted to insist that when you're dead, you're nothing at all, uh, denying the possibility of an afterlife or resurrection heresy, and for that, and other translational misdemeanors, <coughs> he was burnt at the stake where he was there in Paris, along with his translations. A performative act can lead to counter-performances. <laughs> Final example on that, 
Uh, you might be aware that the ex-president and for some still president of Catalonia, Carlos Puigdemont, is currently in Germany. There's an extradition warrant from Spain for him to be brought back um, to Spain to face trial. Uh, one of the little tricks in the um, in, in the case brought against him, the uh, uh, the accusations by the uh, prosecuting judge in Spain, uh, is this: uh, the, the the text is written in a peculiar voice, as you can see here. Uh, if you know the Spanish, it's a, uh, a first-person plural. He's talking about. This is a strategy of the independent strategy of Carlos Puigdemont. Que sufrimos, that we suffered. Well, that suffered is a strong one, but that occurred to us, if you like. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is that that, when it's translated into German, uh, is not rendered at all. That, that first person uh, plural is omitted. Why is it omitted? Because there's a problem. If the accusation says sufrimos, then they are the victims of the crime. And the victim of a crime cannot be the judge of a crime. Which is one reason why he may not be extradited to, uh, back to Spain. Yeah. So, ah, you see, they're cutting these lawyers, right? Uh, so what the Catalan lawyers have done is present to uh, the German uh, the judges, in this case, a uh, counter-translation, a second translation of what the Spanish text actually says. And so the Germans are going to take 60 days now to look at this and other similar evidence where there is this similar slippage between the, the text and the translation. And the slippage is absolutely the ball. It's, it's, it's trying to achieve things or hide things uh, that... Uh, have absolute bearing on the outcomes. So for my linguistic analysis, I, I want to um, say that the kind of performativity that translations can achieve is actually, and I think you can see it in all these cases, a performativity that comes from having rival translations. There is something that could have been done and another translation that did something else. And the constructive part of it, the constructive ambiguity, comes from when people accept these rival translations and don't want to go into it. Resolution 242, the One China policy, constructive, we're not going to go into it. But if people do go into it and say, hey, the German says this and the Latin or Greek says this, or the French says this, and they do that, when they do go into it and pick up on the performativity, that constructive ambiguity, can become eminently destructive. Also, the kind of work I'm talking about, this performance, is obviously, I think, not taking place in one culture or the other. It's taking a place in the cultural place where translators work in general, not in all cases, uh, which I call intercultures, intercultures professional intercultures, places where people from various cultural provenance work together in order to establish the primary relations between cultures. It's a professional space of work between many, many different professions, but where diversity of provenance is one of the constitutive factors of the location. I won't go into it too much for lack of time. That was my first problem, and that was the linguistic analysis. Now for a second problem. Remember this text where you started on this with this text here? The second problem comes from this phrase, Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait. Why are they mentioning this either side thing? Now, interpret that phrase, and if you're in Beijing, you'll see it's saying Beijing maintains there is one China and Taiwan is part of it. That's what it says, doesn't it? However, if you're in Taipei, at that time in 1972, and Taipei still calls itself the Republic of China, because they think that all of China belongs to them. 
Taipei maintains that there is one China and Taiwan is not. The only difference is that on one reading, Beijing rules the lot, and on the other reading, Taipei rules the lot, but both readings are compatible with the English text. And this was an intentional ambiguity at the time. It's come out in the uh, released papers from Nixon's uh, secret conversations with Chiang Mai that uh, he sought to maintain this ambiguity that says, for as long as I can rule the bureaucrats, it's going to stay that way. And it has stayed that way. Now, this is not a translation problem because the, uh, the ambiguity can be expressed in English and in Chinese and in virtually any other language. You can just translate it literally. People say, you know, you have to understand the text in order to translate it. That's rubbish. <laughs> you just say what, I mean, this is fundamentally ambiguous. And, and a translator can't be called upon to interpret that text because it's, it's you know, above his pay grade, his or her pay grade, okay? You just translate that literally and the ambiguity is going to function in whatever language you translate it into. That, that's not the problem. Now what's going on here, and this I take from a, a Bosnian Croatian scholar, uh, Raha, who, who has worked on, on this, this diplomatic language, uh, goes all the way back to Herodotus. And it goes back to Croesus. Croesus, big powerful man, the first to occupy part of the Greek states, uh, is thinking about attacking Persia. So he goes to the Oracle of Delphi and says, what do you reckon? I'll go and attack Persia. What's going to happen? And of course, uh, the Oracle says, uh, if you send an army against the Persians, you will destroy a great empire. So it says Herodotus. Of course, he goes and attacks the Persians. He's defeated and he destroys a great empire, notably his own. However, he could not see that reading in the oracle because he was so great and strong, it was unthinkable that the second reading could ever be embedded there. Hubris is what that's called. Hubris says, you're going to read the text that best suits you and thereby will not see the other texts. And that leads not to constructive ambiguity, but again, to destruction. Uh, Baha's analysis is really going through the oracle's intentions of whether or not it was ethically valid. Uh, I'm less concerned with that, uh, but it, it is uh, quite appealing uh, that the fundamentally Greek oracle could let hubris lead to nemesis, okay, uh, to, to downfall. It's his own fault because he read the oracle wrongly because it was too powerful. There's a certain uh, justice in that. And that would be the literary kind of analysis or purely political analysis that we would want to give. If we allow the Chinese to have their reading, what will that lead to at the time? Or if the Chinese cannot see the alternative reading in the English text, what will that lead to over time? I move now to the kind of translation analysis that interests me at the moment, which is just drawing on risk management. Risk management is uh, used all over the place in economics and business, obviously. Uh, but it's, it's probabilistic studies of, of various outcomes and the strategic use of those probabilities that interest me. It interests me because whereas uh, a translation studies based on accuracy would say, well, we, we want to get equivalence. Um, I'm more interested in why you want that equivalence. And it seems to me that you want something like that or the illusion of equivalence in order to establish trust. And that success in translation from the translator's perspective, but I include interpreters in that, Success is when you get trust between th minimally three actors, all trust each other and trust the validity of what is said. And trust can mean, I'm not going to look 
into it any, any further. Whatever you say is going to be right. I trust you. It's too complicated for me. You experts say what you want to influence their thought, and that's a necessary part of that constructive ambiguity. Now, risk management, to simplify things very quickly, uh, allows some basic options. One is risk aversion, avoid the risk. Uh, tone it down. Translators are usually incredibly risk averse. When you've got a, a juicy problem, uh, you can leave it out. That's not a lot. Don't tell anybody about it. Uh, if it's a problem of specificity, uh, the general solution is to generalize. Go up one level. Go to, to a superordinate. Uh, you won't be right, but you won't be wrong. People won't, you know, as long as you maintain trust and people hear a text that is more or less what they expect, you'll be okay. Risk transfer, on the other hand, is when you just say what's there. I don't know what it means. I'll give it as it is. I'm not the one to blame. It's in the text. The author wrote it. I transfer risk over to that side, etc. Or I draw on established equivalents. Somebody else did it, or I point to a dictionary, things like this. Or in special cases, I go back to the client and I say, ah, oh, look, I'm going into into Spanish in Latin America, do you want me to use the T or the form? Do I use do or stay? Do I use the formal or informal second person? Because I'm not sure about the country going into. The client says, do what you do in Spain. So do, then you're going to be wrong in a lot of countries. But it's not your fault because the client said, risk transfer. Can be done. And then there's risk assess acceptance when translators take on the risk and hope to reap the corresponding benefits. They rarely do. Uh, we see some of the negative benefits taken by translators of the order of Martin Luther and Edwin Dole. People get killed. There's another strategy, and I think the one that, that fits best the case I'm studying here, is risk mitigation in the narrow technical sense of mitigation, where you take on one risk in order to mitigate, to re reduce the effect of the other. So risk mitigation are these things up here, these sprinklers, right? If we have a fire in this building, it's not going to burn down. Water's going to come out here. An incredible amount of water damage will be done to this beautiful carpet, for example. And that's going to be bad, but it's going to be less bad than the whole building burning up. So this is risk mitigation. Okay, we take on one risk, water damage, because it's less than the greater risk, the whole building burning down in the fire. Okay? Mitigation. Now, what's happened here is that Let's go back to the one China example. The major risk would be that disagreement over Taiwan blocks any cooperation between the United States and China. That's the one thing that Nixon and Kissinger could not handle. That the one purpose of them going to China, entering into this negotiation, was to avoid that risk. So we produce this ambiguous text, and it occurs a minor risk. But Chinese readers will act on their own reading and assume that the United States has agreed to one China, which is the case for this. Or English readers will have access to the Chinese and say, the Chinese don't say what we're saying in our texts. But that doesn't happen either, because Chinese is hard and difficult, written in funny characters in English. So in this case, constructive ambiguity has worked marvelously because the Minor risks are less than the major risk. And as long as that relationship holds, the minor risks are less than the major risk, trust bridges over the slippages of language. And that trust is another word for equivalence. We know that language is open to interpretation. We know that it's slippery, that it never applies to any pre-existing reality. And yet we trust each other. Why do we trust each other? Because we don't want to look too closely at it. Or because the risks of looking at it too closely would be greater than the benefits of accepting it as it is. 
And we do this in our everyday life with the people we love. What is love if not that? I'm not going to look too closely at you. The details of your imperfections. Indeed, <laughs> <laughs> if we did, we are going to get into trouble. <laughs> All right. Uh, destructive ambiguity, the kind that would lead to a translating any burden of the state, for example, is when the minor risks become greater than the major. I close now with an example of why translation studies might be concerned with accuracy. It's an example from uh, the classes I teach in Melbourne, which are in a, a master's level uh, program for English Chinese. And I get the students to write an article on translations they've done in other classes and to explain the solutions that they use and why do you use them. And one of the texts used in the other class, not mine, in, last year was this one from the New York Times, which says literally there that China has challenged America's military superiority with forays into the East and South China Seas and by bullying American allies in the region. China has become more assertive politically. Uh, this was written by an Australian. The actual title of that piece was Trump is Pushing Australia Towards China. If you want the politics of it. Uh, now, the Chinese students initially, and, and not just a few, I mean, the majority, would not translate those terms, bullying and assertive, as they stand with all their force. Uh, assertive would become confident, for example, toned down and made to seem positive. Bullying, uh, this was actually a very literary translation, to show severity, to exhibit one's power. Now, bullying can be to exhibit your power, but bullying is bad for us, I hope. To exhibit power, mm, it's hubris, but it's a classical sin if if a sin at all. Okay. And the uh, general tendency was in this way to tone down and ultimately justify uh, Chinese policy in the South China Sea, which is the area that most concerns Australia at the moment. The most extreme uh, rendition, however, was bullying uh, rendered as deterrence, such as China has become a deterrent to American presence in the region. That is, China is saving these countries from the American presence. I think, well, that's, that's a creative translation. That's really going well, okay? And then the commentary uh, given by the student, because I asked them what they do and then why do they do it, uh, is this, that as a Chinese citizen, I tend to use commendatory terms when translating words and sentences related to China. Now, hold on. Before we say, don't do that, this is risk management. Yeah. Yeah. This is real risk management. I've got Chinese students who write, who write doctoral dissertations, and I have to say, look, don't go into issues of Tiananmen Square. Or don't go into Taiwan. Just avoid that. You'll stay out of trouble. You've got to get a job when you go back to the country, and, and you're not going to get into political problems. Similarly, the kill the messenger idea does work. Uh, the initial reaction of the Chinese students is tone down what's there because I don't want to get into trouble. So, uh, the Chinese word here means that American allies are willing to be controlled by China because of its great power in the region. So that the text that was initially incredibly critical of Chinese foreign policy, here translated into Chinese, has been turned on its head. And China comes in as the victory, saving the region from the very influence. Now, what are the consequences of constructive ambiguity? One of them is that everybody in these separate cultures continues believing 
that the other culture conforms to their ideals. The Chinese believe the Americans have agreed to the one China policy. The Chinese believe that they are a benign soft power in Southeast Asia. And that belief, and, and similarly in the United States, we have this idea through not just self-interested translations, but the lack of translations, that the rest of the world conforms to what we would like them to be. That constructive ambiguity can work well enough for establishing trade or whatever you want to do. But in the long term, if no negative messages get through, if the negative messages are filtered out consistently, the price of hubris may be destruction, as was found in forays into Persia in the Rodotus. For that reason, I'm quite pleased to say that we managed to convince all those students that ethically they should translate more accurately. Thank you very much. Thank you.